ready to start, so let me say good evening and welcome to the July installment of our third Thursday uh, lecture series. I'm John Abel, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Thomas Monkhill. Dr. Monkhill will discuss how cross-regional connections have influenced people and places here in eastern Monroe County. He is retired from a 40-year uh, teaching career, and he has taught history teaching training uh, to teachers uh, across the United States and in Cambodia. Not quite as exotic as Cambodia, but a little closer to home. He also teaches courses over at Talk in East Stroudsburg. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bunker. Thank you, John. So if uh, you don't see me move around, I, I'm going to be in one place because I'm being videotaped here. I have a few thank yous to start out. First, you have the Monroe County Historical Association. Thank you for inviting me. And then uh, thanks to the uh, Shawnee Resort for hosting this. Uh, thanks to uh, Julie and Tanya for setting up all of the uh, technology, and thanks to you, my friends, for coming. So uh, let me get right to it. When I was a, uh, a young person in the 50s and 60s, I studied world history. As I'm sure almost everybody in the room studied that subject. But as I reflect back on that, the world history I studied was really European history writ large upon the globe. Europeans were agents, and everybody else basically was trying to get along. That changed big time in the early 1980s when a new world history movement started to develop. I've been involved with that since it started. And it focuses on, as I'm going to show you, it focuses on looking at local history, such as Eastern Monroe County, in a very broad context. I mean, as broad as you can get. What happened very far away from Monroe County that has some significant influence here, and sometimes vice versa, many times vice versa. I think that was partially the result of uh, scholars and teachers realizing in the 1980s that we lived in a connected world. It was linked. So in addition to understanding the present as a linked world, maybe we should look back and see where this, these sets of developments came from. So in terms of, in terms of world history, I, I can't I'm used to going out to the map and showing you things, so I just draw your attention to the map. I'm going to reference three of these connections or trade routes, long, long distance. I'm going to use a lot of terminology from world history, and uh, if, if something is not clear, please wait until the discussion at the end, and we'll clarify anything that, that you may want to. But these are long distance trade routes in early modern world history in the Atlantic Basin. It's obvious, okay? So I'm going to reference the second one from the top. It's red, it's going from the 13 British colonies going back toward Western Europe, that's one. It's identified as fur trade, very, very important in our story tonight. The second one is the red one, it would be the third one down, it's going from the West Indies and it's going back to Western Europe and the third one is coming out of West Africa down here at the bottom of the map, and it's going to Brazil, West Indies. This is the long distance trade in enslaved people. I will reference all three of these in reference to Monroe County. Now, a few examples. So here we have these people, obviously, are not the history of Monroe County. These are the Apaches from the southwest of North America. Some of the most efficient, effective guerrilla fighters ever. 
They don't want to mess with them. And they are an indigenous, native indigenous story in the Southwest. But they're also a world history story because their ancestors, just like the ancestors of the Lenape and the Shawnee, came from Northeastern Asia, 17, roughly 17, if I say circa, I'm saying roughly 17,000 years ago, coming across the land bridges <clears throat> in the Bering Sea, which were exposed above the Bering Sea because of the last ice age. The world history theme is migration. So these people originally from Northeast Asia, not from Texas, West Texas and New Mexico. But there's much more in this story because it was the horse that made these people unbelievably effective guerrilla fighters, meaning they would hit and run. Wouldn't fight pitch battles for obvious reasons. They couldn't win. The horse was brought by the Spanish conquistadores to Mexico. In the early 16th century, some of the horses got away. These are the Mustangs on the Great Plains. But since they were brought by the Spanish, they weren't Spanish horses. They had their genes in the Arabian Peninsula because Muslims controlled Spain for at least 700 years, from 730 until 1492. And they brought with them the whole, the whole culture along with their fauna. So, so these horses have Arabian genes, they have North African Berber genes, they have genes, equine genes from Spain. And so now, just think about it in terms of the Apache. How many global regions have I referenced? I'll tell you, Northeast Asia, North America, Western Europe, North Africa, Middle East. That's five global regions all linked together just in the story of the Apache. That's what world historians are interested in. That's what we like to do. Some people in the History Academy get uptight about world history, even, even today, because they think we're trying to replace traditional history. No, all we're trying to do is to complement it. You want to study about the Apache? Fine. We just want to complement your understanding. All right, a second example. Anybody know bluegrass music? Bluegrass music, this is a poster of Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Bluegrass, what is it? It's, it is a genre of uh, country music. It is found basically in the Appalachians. It was brought by Scotch-Irish migrants in the 17th century, came through the port of Philadelphia and down into the Appalachians. You can understand it that way, but I ask you to take a look at the instrumentation of a traditional bluegrass band. If you look carefully, I know how clear it is in the back. You have a banjo. Banjo is from West Africa. It was brought by the enslaved people to the West Indies and then brought into South Carolina. You have, there's a fiddle there. You see him on the far left, that's Celtic. That's Scottish, that's Western European. But Bill Monroe, the guy in the middle, is playing a mandolin. And the person to his right is playing a Spanish guitar. So both of these instruments are Spanish. Mandolin and guitar, but they really aren't. You know where I'm going. Once again, Muslims controlled Spain for 700 years and they brought their musical instruments with them. So the antecedent of the mandolin and the Spanish guitar are Muslim, and you can trace them back to Central Asia, Middle East, North Africa, Middle East, I mean, uh, Western Europe, and in this case, the Appalachians. So that should give you some, some notion of what world historians are interested in. So let's get going with Monroe County. 
Right up the road, you have the Minasink Paleo site. As, as I'm sure you know, you really can't visit it because people are concerned about people stealing things, archaeological remains and so forth. But it's at the confluence of the Broadhead Creek and the Delaware River. Okay. This, by Paleo, that term's archaeological term means old Stone Age. These were people who were hunters and gatherers, and since they, they were at the, the confluence of those two bodies of water, they, they had all the fish they wanted. Uh, but the important point about world history is that just like the Apache, the, the ancestors of the people who set up that, one of the first Paleolithic sites east of the Mississippi, it's right here, five miles away, had their origin in Northeastern Asia. One of the basic uh, examples of proof of that is that the blood types of the of most indigenous Americans, Native American, I use the phrase indigenous Americans, or first peoples, very similar to the blood types of people in Northeastern Asia, not to mention teeth shape and jaw shape and things of that nature. So right here we have an example of one of the fundamental connective processes in world history that influence Monroe County. That's migration. I don't mean migration from Philadelphia to Eastern. I mean migration from Northeastern Asia across to what we call Alaska, all the way down south to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip South America. That's a world history story, and you have it right here in your backyard. Uh, for time, the, the last ice age, I'll say circa. You can, you can find eight different books on the last ice age. You get eight different dates. Circa, 15,000 BCE. If I say BCE, or CE, I'm referring to the, the, the common terminology used by academics today rather than the traditional uh, BC before Christ, AD Anno Domini. In most of the academic world, that's been rejected because of its religious connections, its Christian connections, and the BCE, CE is seen as more acceptable to, uh, to the academy. So you're looking here, this, this migration occurred maybe 17,000 years ago. It had tremendous influence in uh, <clears throat> eastern Monroe County. Ah, okay. So now, at the same site, you have the menacing Neolithic site. Neolithic, lithic is stone. Stone Age, Neo is new. This is New Stone Age. And right, I can't tell you exactly where it is because you can't visit it, but right along that archaeological site on River Road, uh, there is, or there was a uh, farming community. So when I say the, the word farming, most people just blow it off. Okay, they farm. This is this is one of the fundamental changes, macro changes in all of human history. I'll say that again. The switch from hunting and gathering and fishing, as the people originally did at the menacing site, to growing your food in the ground. And that, that change was evolutionary. The, the, the term is the agricultural revolution. It wasn't a revolution, it was an evolution. It's a gradual, gradual change. In terms of macro change, uh, I'll define a term for you. It's a fundamental alteration in the way humans live. Now this is a rhetorical question for all of you. How many macro changes, when you think about human history, how many macro changes do you recognize? Many world historians, I'm not one of them, many world historians believe there have only been two 
that really matter. One is the gradual, in some cases, accidental evolution of farming, which occurred in different places of the world at different times. And the second is the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine. So you have a macro change site five minutes from here, maybe 10 minutes by car. There's more though about this Neolithic site that I think is really important to world historians and maybe to you. And that is <clears throat> one of the crops that they grew at the confluence of the Broadhead Creek, Delaware River, maize, corn, sweet corn, maize. Maize has its origin in Mesoamerica. To be more precise, it has its origin in caves in southern Oaxaca State, where Sue and I have been. The, the, the approximate date for the first cultivation of maize, which occurred, I don't know how far away, maybe my friend who teaches geography knows how far away uh, Shawnee is from Oaxaca. It's a couple of thousand miles at least, maybe more. The maize was first cultivated approximately 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BCE, and yet by 200 BCE, the indigenous were growing maize right in our backyard. Okay, so what? The so what is, this is another excellent example of a world history connective process. The first one I referenced was migration. All right? This one is the diffusion of plants or of flora diffusion. Just think about this. When, when it's a rhetorical question for you. When you study world history, how much focus on the diffusion of plants did you study about? Okay, that's changed. Why has it changed? Well, one, in many reasons, but and you can see I'm focusing on it here. And just think about this, for example. Because for maize, to make it from Mesoamerica, very close to the Guatemalan border, I mean, it was one of the basic foods of the Maya, and be able to be grown and feed people in what became Monroe County. Think about all of the biological adaptations that that plant had to make to be grown here in what we today call Monroe. So this is flora diffusion. Extremely important. Why is that important to the world of stories? Is because just think about the 1960s. Earth Day, the environmental movement, the focus on how important the biosphere is to all of us made its way into world history big time. So I've already given you two really important connective processes migration the movement of people, and second, the movement of plants, maize from Mesoamerica. Now we're going to move forward in time to the Mincy Path. Mincy Path, long before the Europeans came, long before William Penn, long before Nicholas Dupuis, there was a, an indigenous trail that linked the, I've forgotten the indigenous name for the Hudson, I'm going to say it linked the Hudson River with the Delaware. And today it's Route 209, essentially. And if you look at this map, I could go over there, but the, uh, you can see on the map you have the Hudson River in north of 
Hudson River, you have the town of Kingston. Kingston was originally a Dutch settlement in New Netherlands, established maybe about 1615, 1620 CE. And Kingston sits on the Hudson River. Now, Sue and I used to live very close to Kingston, and I would walk out of the old city and I'd be on 209, which was the Mincy Path. It went, made its way all the way down 209. If you know uh, <clears throat> New York State, it runs south, right into Port Jervis, and then follows down River Road and going out to the west. In terms of uh, world history connective themes, the one that's up there is colonialism. That's obvious. One people taking over somebody else's territory and then setting up an entire administrative program, including roads, including government, including laws. And that certainly happened here. Uh, the Dutch never really controlled. It's hard for me to, to research this. They controlled no territory, what's today called Monroe County. I was little, I'm new to the area, so I thought that Bush Kill was in Monroe County. I found out, no, it's not in Monroe County, it's in Pike County, okay? But I mean, it's really close. And the word Bush Kill is Dutch. And matter of fact, there's a creek up there that has a redundant name. It's called Bush Kill Creek. So if you translate that, it means Bush Creek Creek. Of course, kill means creek in Dutch. So there was, there certainly was Dutch cultural influence, and we'll, we'll get into that with Nicholas Dupuy later on. The name of the Delaware River, right outside here. So what this shows is a, uh, a picture of a British explorer. Captain Samuel Argyle, he named the Delaware River. And in 1609, that's a pretty important date in colonial history. It's the date of, of uh, Hudson also. And Argyle was sent out by the Virginia Company, Virginia Company, a multinational corporation, a proto-multinational corporation. This is not the British government. This is uh, British people with capital to invest, investing in a, uh, a business to make a profit by setting up a colony that was called Jamestown, and later on, the colony of Virginia. So Argyle was trying to find a shortcut from British Isles, get down to Virginia, and he, on the way, he named this river out here. I don't know the Lenape P name, sorry, but he named it Delaware. Okay, fine. Uh, the world history theme is at the bottom, the connective theme. This is the third or fourth one I've referenced, and this is exploration. This is Argyle, this is Henry Hudson, this is Captain Cook, this is NASA. It's all in the same process, connecting parts of the world and parts of the, the uh, the planets and so forth, and, and uh, these connections bring about change. But that's not where I really want to go here with the Delaware River. Because Argonne named this river for this person, Sir Thomas West, the third Baron Delaware. Why? why? Why name it in his honor? I mean, the guy, Argonne was working for the Virginia Company. Thomas West was the largest investor in the company. Say again, this is proto-capitalism. This is proto-global capitalism. Another connective theme, which we're all aware of today. Uh, and Thomas West was the first governor of Jamestown Colony. Uh, so the world history themes, many I've referenced, a multinational corporation, talking about Google, 
colonialism, global capitalism, okay, fine. But then I want to get back to William the Conqueror. Normans. Normans were Vikings. Normans. Vikings from Scandinavia who used to raid central France because their ships were engineered in such a way they could go in shallow rivers, relatively shallow rivers such as the Seine, and they could beach those ships without any problems. And they used to raid and pillage. They, they, they raided Paris and burned it down a couple of times. So eventually the French government made a deal with the Normans and said, look, we will give you part of what became called France, Normandy. Just leave us alone. Okay, fine. And then in 1066, the Normans invaded England. This is William Conqueror. This is the Doomsday Book. This is the end of Angle, Angle control over England and a beginning of three or four hundred year period of French control of what we call England today. What does that have to do with the Delaware River? Thomas West, the Baron Delaware, is a French name. He was a descendant of the Normans. I didn't mention, in terms of social class, when the Normans conquered England, they took the, the non-Normans and put them in the lower class. And they took the best land. So they had the most wealth. And this man is a descendant of that. So, so in terms, this is not about world history. This is about appreciating history, any history. And all of you folks appreciate history, otherwise you wouldn't be here. It's understanding, this is from me now, it's understanding the present, in this case, 17th century, looking at what happened in the past that had significant influence in the present. That really informs my understanding of the present. Hopefully it does uh, for you also. Um, someone help me out. Who, who is the great... Uh, United States writer from the from the state of Mississippi or from the Deep South, early 20th century. Say again. It's not Mark Twain. Thank you. Faulkner. Faulkner. William Faulkner. I'm going to paraphrase. The past is not dead. In fact, it's not even the past. I love that. In terms of understanding past and the present. Thank you very much, William Faulkner. Okay, Delaware, descendant of William the Conqueror. His name's right out here. Shawnee, village of Shawnee. I noticed a sign on my way in tonight, 1725, if I'm correct. Establishment of it. Shawnee have their, uh, the Shawnee indigenous group, they have their homeland in today what's called Ohio. And you remember when we started? I showed you that, that red arrow, one of the long distance trade routes, and it said fur trade. Okay. Fur trade, extremely important in terms of understanding Shawnee and, and their history. Because in the middle of the 17th century, you can see the date up there, 1640. Two powerful indigenous groups fought over hunting grounds in Ohio. And they were hunting beaver. Shawnee were one, the other group was the, uh, the Iroquois from central New York. Came south. Why? What was the big deal? By this time, this is the middle of the 17th century, 1640, the Dutch still controlled the Hudson River. British took it over in 16, let's say 1666, 1667, in wars between the Netherlands and uh, the English. 
1640, the trading posts were in what is the capital of New York State today in Albany. And so in terms of geography, Albany is the location when the depth of the Hudson River becomes so shallow that ocean-going ships cannot go any farther north. Okay? So there you have Dutch establishing Fort Orange, which later on became English Albany. That was the trading post for the fur trade. So that the indigenous people in New York, what became Pennsylvania, Ohio, they would trap these beaver. They trapped them almost to extinction. And they brought the furs, let's say they brought them to Albany, and they were taken south on the Hudson River back into Western Europe, and they were made into these fancy beaver hats. Maybe you've seen some of those. But this was serious business, because in exchange for beaver, the Dutch and then later on the British would trade early guns, proto guns. So in terms of the trading of the early guns, another world history connected process is technological diffusion. The movement of machines or tools from one place to another place very far away. What does it have to do with the Shawnee? Shawnee was defeated by the Iroquois. The Iroquois took over the hunting grounds in central Ohio. I, I would assume by 16, this is an inference, I would assume by 1640, the beaver in what is today called Pennsylvania, no, they were gone. New York, they were gone. Hunted out. So let's get to from Ohio. The Shawnee were forced to leave. Many of them went south and, and connected with the five nations down there, the, the uh, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek. Now these are the people who moved out west by Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. That's forced migration. Forced migration is a big difference. Okay. Uh, but, but some of the Shawnee were welcomed by the Lenape. And they moved right back in here along the Delaware. So the world history themes, the, the fur trade is long distance trade. I mean over long distance we got we have trade here across the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the next point to understand about Monroe County and world history. And that is until the time of Columbus, 1490, let's say 1500 CE, Atlantic Ocean, I don't want to say all the oceans in the world, the Atlantic Ocean was a mass separator of humans. You want proof? When the Spanish came to what's today called Mexico, and they called New Spain, they brought with them unknowingly, and no one knew until uh, the late 19th century that microbes caused disease. No one knew that. So the Spanish brought with them Afro-Eurasian disease that they had developed over millennia some immunity to. We got off the ships in Veracruz and started to relate to the indigenous. The population of New Spain or Mexico dropped 90% in the 16th century. The population of Mexico didn't come back to its 16th century, early 16th century total until the 19th century. Why? Because the Atlantic Ocean separated people. Starting with Columbus, the oceans, at least the Atlantic Ocean, became a connector of humans. And you can see that in the story about the fur trade and the Shawnee. And if you look carefully at this drawing of the Beaver Wars out there in Ohio, you can see some guys hiding behind a tree up there at the top of the image. 
and they're not firing bows and arrows. They're firing one of the most significant trade goods of the early modern period. Traded for beaver. Okay. All right, so I already showed this to you. Ocean's S connectors, I've made that point. That does not mean to say before Columbus that the Indian Ocean was a separator. No way. The Indian Ocean was a huge connector of people from ancient history. Roman women, elite Roman women, wore Chinese silk. Say that again. The elite Roman women wore Chinese silk. How'd they get there? By ocean trade routes from China through the Straits of Malacca, Indian Ocean, uh, and then up through the Middle East. So the Indian Ocean was a huge connector, unlike the Atlantic. Pacific Ocean, not so much. Not so much, I was saying to Captain Cook, late 18th century, really opened up and had the maps where the islands could be found. <clears throat> um, okay. Nicholas de Puy, European founder of Shawnee Village. I don't like that too much. I mean, does it, is that what it says on, on this little... Uh, no, he was, he's the first known settler in this region. No. That's highly questionable. Lenape were here, Shawnee were here. He's first European, okay? I think that's important. <clears throat> Anything else here? What we're gonna to get to is Fort in a little while. Dupuis. Dupuis is a French name. He was a French Protestant. Once again, this is an example of the influence of past the 16th century in French and Western European history and Nicolas de Puy coming into Shawnee Village in the early 18th century. He was a French Protestant. He was a Calvinist. He was, he was someone who was influenced by what is called the Protestant Reformation, Luther and then Calvin. The people who followed Calvin, maybe you recognize some of these groups. Dutch, he was a Dutch reform, okay? We got that one. Uh, Pilgrims were Calvinists. Puritans were Calvinists. Uh, Calvin doesn't get the recognition, that, in my opinion, that Luther gets in a lot of the history books in terms of his influence. But sure you know that the Protestant Reformation in Western Europe in the 16th century I mean, Luther is 1517, early 16th century, was not a peaceful kumbaya movement. There's no way this was kumbaya. There were religious wars across Western Europe between Catholics and Protestants. Religious identity was, I mean, much more important. There was no national identity, or very little at that time religious identity. Dupuis family was a French Calvinist family. The, the, uh, Sue and I used to live in a town called New Paltz, New York, in Hudson Valley. It was established by French Huguenots. H-U-G-U-E-N-O-T-S. Or Huguenots. I prefer to say Huguenot. Huguenots were persecuted big time because they were Calvinists in Catholic France. There were religious wars in Catholic France. Uh, so many of the Huguenots, you can decide if they left France because they were forced to go. Was it forced migration? Or was it voluntary migration? And no one put a gun to their head. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe someone did. OK, so Dupuy. I'd just like to read this. this. This plaque is someplace in Shawnee Village. Maybe it's by the 
the Presbyterian Church, I've forgotten, but I, I did take the plaque someplace, the photograph someplace in Shawnee Village. I'll read it to you because maybe you can't. Nicholas Dupuy, 1682, 1762, first settler of Shawnee, no, okay. Purchased 3,000 acres of land, including the islands of, uh, from the Missy Indians. He was the grandson. This is where I want to go. Nicholas Dupuy was the grandson of Catherine DeVos. You know? And Catherine DeVos, you know, and um, they were Huguenot refugees from Artois, France, who with their sons, Nicholas, John, and Moses, arrived in New Amsterdam in 1662. Why? Why would you go to New Amsterdam and not go to Boston? Or not go to uh, South Carolina? Primarily because the Dutch, you understand, the Dutch broke away from Spanish control and by the early 17th century had created their own state, the Dutch Republic. And the Dutch Republic was a Calvinist, most people were Calvinists. But unlike most Western Europeans at the time who were quite willing to kill you if you had the wrong religion, the Dutch didn't care. The only thing they cared about was could they make money out of the deal. They were businessmen, pure and simple. So as long as you could contribute to the economic feasibility of New Netherland, that was the Dutch colony along the Hudson, Hudson then you were welcome to come. Same thing true of Amsterdam. Amsterdam had one of the largest Jewish populations in Western Europe in the 17th century for the exact same reason. In fact, there are many people who argue that the primary origin of the notion of religious freedom, First Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, comes from Dutch, the Dutch Republic. So the Dupuy family went to New Amsterdam. They weren't going to be hassled. And they settled in a town called Esopus. Esopus is today called Kingston, New York. I referenced that before. And after two or three generations, all of the good land, which, by the way, the Dutch took away from the indigenous. Sound familiar? Uh, all the good land was gone. And many of the third and fourth, fifth generation sons moved south looking for greener pastures. The Pui is just one of those examples. Uh, OK, the world history themes. Forced migration, I've already referenced that, but cultural diffusion is extremely important in terms of understanding world history. It's the idea that, uh, the notion that ideas move over long distances. So the idea that Dupuy is a good example of is the movement of Calvinism. Because if you go a couple of miles north of here and up the, up the hill, you come to the Presbyterian Church, the Reformed Church, Shawnee Village. That's Calvinist. That's a great example of cultural diffusion being brought by the Queen. Uh, the next point about the Huguenots, the French Protestants, the Pui being the grandson of that group. They didn't just come to Shawnee. They went to South Africa. There are many other places, so this is a great example. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Huguenots, Huguenots, migrated out of France to the Netherlands, New Netherlands, Shawnee, Cape Town, Indonesia. Now just think about those five places terms of understanding how world historians see the history of the Queen and the history of this religious group. Netherlands, Western Europe, New Netherlands, North America, Shawnee, North America, Cape Town, South Africa, 
and the, one of the, the Dutch, the main uh, uh, economic base of the Dutch East Indies Company was in Jakarta, uh, Java, or Indonesia. How many global regions connected by the Huguenots alone? Southeast Asia, Africa, Western Europe. That's the world history story, and the term is, is polycentrism. Many, uh, so it, okay. Here's, one of my goals is for you to leave here having a pretty clear conceptual understanding of world history and then how Monroe County fits, Eastern Monroe County fits into it. A term I have in reference so far is polycentrism. World history coined term to challenge the notion, any notions of Eurocentrism. I referenced that before in terms of my education in world history. Afrocentrism, Asian centrism. World history has no center. It's a narrative of connections across many global regions. So it's polycentric. And the Huguenots, the plea coming to uh, Shawnee is a very good example of that. On, on your right, there's an artist rendition of the, the plea fort. I don't know how accurate this is. It's what I could find on Google. But on your left is a great model of a I'm going to say this is a 17th century model of the French architect Vauban, spelled V-A-U-B-A-N. And according to the artist's rendition of the, uh, the Puy Fort here, there's some connection with this, this phenomenal development in 17th century France. And let's, let's take a couple of minutes to focus on that. Those four triangular geometric sections coming out. I'm talking about the left-hand model, right? Vauban's fort. Uh, <clears throat> they were set up to deal with the problem that the defensive castles had for thousands of years. I can't go over there and show you, so you just have to imagine that if you didn't have those bastions, those four triangular bastions coming out at the angles you see in the left-hand model, there were dead points, dead points in the, in the castle wall where the defenders could not see all the attackers. Follow me? Once you have these bastions, there are no dead points whatsoever. This is a huge technological development in Western Europe. Vauban was one of the greatest uh, examples of this. Uh, in terms of the Dupuy Fort, that was, that was part of the French, I want to say a couple of words about the French and in the war too, before I finish up here. But you see in, in the artist's rendition, there are four bastions. They're, they're really poor examples. But this is technological diffusion the movement of new technology, in this case, new military architecture. Okay. We're gonna finish up with uh, Antoine Dutrois. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I almost failed French <laughs> a couple of times. Antoine Dutrois. Antoine was the person who designed, laid out the town of Delaware Water Gap, uh, 1793. Just think about that day for a second. And I have to say, much that I'm going to say about Antoine Dutrois is inferential. Because I didn't write a book on Antoine Dutrois. I just took off the internet what I could find from the, uh, the museum and uh, other sources on the internet. 
1793. But I can make some strong inferences. The, the information online says that Antoine Dutrois was a refugee from Santo Domingo in the Caribbean. That's a mistake. This is not an inference. That's, that's a mistake. He didn't come from Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo uh, in English would be Saint, Saint Dominic, correct? Santo Domingo was the first Spanish city in the Americas in what is today called the Dominican Republic. Still, it's the capital city, Santo Domingo. Where Duque came from was the French colony on the west end of the island of Hispaniola. East end, you have now have the Dominican Republic. West end, you have Haiti. The Puy was a refugee from Saint Domingue. That's uh, I'm really butchering the French. Saint Domingue, Haiti today, slash Haiti since about 1805. Okay, why was he a refugee? I have no evidence that he was a sugar plantation owner. I don't have that evidence. I wish I could, maybe someone here knows that. If you do, please see me after. But he ran for his life in 1791, 1792, came through port following the uh, ocean currents right up to uh, Philadelphia and made his way up to Delaware, Delaware Water Gap. Why was he running away? Saint Domingue was the number one sugar producing colony in the world in the 18th century. French colony. Sugar, in terms of understanding world history, take a look. The left hand map. Sugar has its origin in India, shown in red. The crystallization of sugar from ancient India. Both the plant and the process were moved along the Silk Roads into the Middle East. And you take a look at the green. The green on that map, the left hand map, shows the first sugar plantations in world history. They weren't in South Carolina, they weren't in Brazil, they were not in Saint Domingue. They were in the Eastern Mediterranean. They were run by Muslims who learned the process as a result of long distance trade on Silk Roads and they employed slave labor. Some of the enslaved laborers came from West Africa as a result of the gold salt trade, maybe you know about that process, but most of them, just think of the word S-L-A-V-E, the English word slave. That's been replaced by the phrase enslaved people, which I think is really good. But I want to focus on slave. Take the E out. What do you have? You have Slavic peoples. Most of the people who did the brutal labor work on these medieval sugar plantations in the Eastern Mediterranean were Slavic peoples. They were captured by Vikings, making their way south on the, the great rivers that flow south through Russia and Ukraine. We've all heard about the, the, the Dnipro in the war. For sure it goes through Kiev. And you have the Volga. Vikings came down both of those rivers, captured enslaved Slavic peoples. They came down to Volga, they came into the Caspian Sea and sold them on the Silk Roads to Muslims. If they came down to Dnepro, they came into the Black Sea. And they took them to the slave markets in Constantinople slash Istanbul today. Okay, fine. This entire process <clears throat> was picked up by Europeans and brought to the West Indies. And as I said before, if you look at the right hand picture here, this is an artist's rendition of a sugar plantation in Saint-Domingue, French colony. Number one producer of sugar in the 18th century. The place that Dutrois ran away from. I have no evidence he owned one of these plantations. Why did he run away? It's because
it was the slave revolution. The slaves finally had it. I mean, working on a sugar plantation was brutal. Life expectancy was short. So the slaves rebelled. 1791, 180 sugar plantations were burned to the ground and 4,000 white French killed. Dutrois was not one of them. So if you want to understand the, uh, we'll finish on Antoine, if you want to understand the movement of Dutrois as a refugee, you have to understand the influence of the French Revolution, 1789, on the slave population in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, and then a slave revolt, uh, which eventually led to the creation of the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere, U.S. first, Haiti second. So just to, to summarize, then we'll have a discussion if you'd like. I have up here some of the connective processes that are really important to world history that I've referenced in terms of Monroe County. Uh, top left, migration, flora diffusion, movement of plants, forced migration, oceans connecting people. And you can read, you can read them on your own if they're of interest. And uh, with that said, maybe I can bring this to a close and move around a little bit and answer some questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Let me stay here for a quick. Oh, I'll stay right here. So we have a discussion. Uh, I feel pretty much at home now. So uh, we, we have the floors open for discussion. Questions, issues. I really hope that, that when you leave, you'll have some fairly clear conceptual understanding of what world historians do. We're interested in local history, but we're interested in local history in a very broad context. I find that really very, uh, very interesting. Okay. Ah. Yes, sir. Well, when, when Anton Dutro got, Dutro got here, when he got here, maybe he was running for something, maybe he didn't, but he must have had, he must have had uh, access to Gap, because what he did in the Gap was just, he did significant things when he got to the Gap, besides name the place after himself. Um, he laid out the town, correct? He laid out the town, he built a kid at Tinny Hotel, he, built, he made sure that the school was built, uh, he built a, a road that he charged people for, and he argued with his neighbor constantly, Mr. Howley. So, you know, Antoine was, Antoine was actually a pretty good guy. I'm not knocking Antoine, I, I, not at all. Uh, but just to based upon that, that information that you gave us, Bill, right? Don. Don. John, 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 thank you. Don. Um, okay, so he was a man of some means. Right, right who ran away from Santa Man. So did he own one of these plantations? It, it's just inferential thinking. That's all I can say. Yes, sir. If we lived in any other county, in any other state, did we have the same presentation on the influences of that particular spot? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, it, uh, I find it to be a lot of fun. And it's not that hard to do. It really isn't. If you have a conceptual understanding of world history, for example, I'm reading a novel now. Sue so and I run a book group. It's entitled Bless Me Ultima. And it's about Mexican Americans living just after World War II in New Mexico. And th there's a mention in there of maybe 20 or 30 foods that people eat in this family. So all I had to do, one of them is cinnamon. All I had to do was look up Google cinnamon origin. Boom. Has nothing to do with New Mexico. Its origin is Sri Lanka, Ceylon. 
brought by the Portuguese. Or they eat empanadas. Okay? It's New Mexico now. They, they eat empanadas. Empanadas are not indigenous to Mexico and New Mexico. They're brought by the Spanish. But they're not indigenous to Spain. I found this out just by Googling empanadas origin. They were originally Muslim breadstuffs filled with meat that Muslims brought into Spain and also brought into India. You go to an Indian restaurant, you have empanadas, where the origin is in the Middle East. So yeah, it's fun. It's not that hard to do. You, which, if you're interested, you need this conceptual understanding. Then you can just apply it any way you want. Please. That's a great question. Thank you very much. I can't speak about Pennsylvania, but I taught in New York State for 33 years. I taught world history at the high school level. And okay, so in the 70s, it was the old world history. By the middle of the 1980s, the, the world history text reflected much of this new world history movement that I have been speaking about. If you like now, if anybody's interested and you want to read some of the seminal books in this movement, I would say read anything written by Jerry Bentley, anything written by um, William H. McNeil, and Alfred Crosby. Just check those three out. And if you want to read one single book, to understand world history conceptually, the book is The Human Web. Just think about the connections of the human web, okay? Written by McNeil and his son McNeil. Great book. I think one of the things that Bishop Lawrence Knight said, America is a mixture of a whole lot of influences. Right, right. So, okay, thank you very much. It's a polycentric story. I mean, uh, there are a certain number of archaeologists who claim that the first that the first people other than the indigenous from Northeast Asia in the Americas were Polynesians. And they found chicken bones on some archaeological sites. I'm going to say in the jungles of South America, in some place maybe Peru near the coast. No chickens in the Americas until Spanish. But the chicken bones predate Cortex. So maybe there's much more to learn. Not to mention the Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and West Coast. And absolutely. Please. I find it interesting. You, you're talking about world history and world history that, in, in my age, was taught didn't incorporate botany and and uh, arch, you know archaeology and, and the, the ice age and those kinds of things. We talked about history, and then I listened to this gentleman speak about um, Dutrois as a good guy, uh, and I then I started to think that. The history that we've been given or been formed is basically identifying good guys versus bad guys as opposed to actual environment around all of these people. So uh, many, many history books in the past and present have been written to, uh, to support a certain political program. There's no doubt. Many of them in U.S. history were written to support a national, the development of a national identity in a new country, the United States, in the 19th century. But that's been, that's been challenged big time by revision. I mean, world history is revisionist history. It, it's saying Eurocentric world history is just part of the picture. In terms of good guys and bad guys, um, if you read Alfred Crosby, 
he's he's the best uh, in terms of understanding the movement of plants and animals in world history. Uh, the two books, one would be Columbian Exchange, and the second one, which I, I think is even a better book, is called Ecological Imperialism. Ecological Imperialism. Here's a question for you, maybe we we'll close with this. Why would the British import bees to New Zealand? in the 1850s. This is from Alpha Cruz, we look, ecological imperialism. Say again, why would the British import bees to New Zealand in the 1850s? What was the main business in New Zealand? What were they, what were they, what were they raising? Sheep. Sheep? What the sheep eat? Clover. Clover has to be pollinated. So that's, that's the world history story focusing on ecology and flora diffusion and imperialism. I also think when you use the reference that he's a good guy, he's in perspective of the person he's talking about. Yeah. 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 Yeah.